Thank you, Lena. Uh, it's a real pleasure and honor to be here for the first of the GRIT talks, the eight talks. Uh, and um, really appreciate your attention. Uh, so uh, I'm going to start with um, a concept of self-assembly. And I'm going to be talking about self-assembly from a biological standpoint. Uh, but I wanted to give you an example of a self-assembly machine that was created by MIT and Harvard together uh, that does a kind of a cool thing. So it starts out as a flat sheet with some electronics on it. And that thing assembles itself automatically into something that can stand up and ultimately move around and become a moving robot. And uh, that's a, a nice example of a self-assembling machine. So I think this is pretty cool. but. There are much more interesting um, and more complex self-assembling machines that have been around much longer than this on the planet. Uh, in fact, self-assembling machines that are so complex that they have the ability to figure out how they work themselves. And that self-assembling ma machine is shown here. That is a human embryo, the most complex self-assembling machine in the universe that we know about. Um, so starting with one cell, a fertilized egg cell, that is converted through about, obviously, nine months of gestation into a cell with a hundred, uh, into a, a embryo or a baby with a hundred trillion cells uh, that has an enormous amount of complexity. And we're uh, fascinated with this problem of self-assembly. We want to understand the rules, uh, the, the, uh, the instructions for this self-assembly process and how we can change those instructions uh, to uh, make uh, organs, for example, useful for human medicine. Okay, so instead of working on humans, uh, we work with models, uh, but not these kinds of models. Uh, we, people don't like it when you work on humans for a lot of these experiments for obvious reasons. So we use a different kind of model that uh, aren't quite as beautiful as these. By the way, I think if I had looked like either of those, I probably wouldn't have gone into science. I could have been a model instead. Uh, but I've been told most of my life that I have a great face for radio, so uh, I think maybe I've chosen the right career. Okay, so uh, these are the models that we're attracted to. Uh, these are our, uh, the beautiful models that are used in experimental biology, these and others. Um, and in particular, many of these are used to understand how that self-assembly process occurs, how embryos unfold from a fertilized egg into a complex multicellular organism. And I just want to show you that self-assembly process. Uh, many of you have probably seen it, but um, it's, it's, I think, more striking than the self-assembly of that robot. Uh, these are sea urchins, frogs, and fruit flies, common model organisms for understanding how embryos are assembled. And you can see there's an enormous amount happening, obviously. Uh, it's a very complex process. All of this is driven by genes. Genes result in the unfurling of the embryo into a complex animal, starting from a fertilized egg. And all the information, all the self-assembly instructions are packed into the fertilized egg. There's really no significant information coming from the outside. So this is really a truly remarkable self-assembly process. The uh, model organism that we work on, um, and we've chosen to study the self-assembly process uh, through, is an animal called C. elegans, a, a little worm. It consists of only 1,000 cells, but it's actually the most famous worm on the planet. Uh, it has, again, only 1,000 cells, but it's the only uh, little worm that I know about that's had a book written about it. Um, and there have been six Nobel Prizes awarded to people doing research on this organism because of the really tremendous discoveries that have been made with the system. And let me show you, I just want to hit a few high points. So this is the self-assembly of this creature, that is embryonic development in C. elegans, where in this animal we can follow every single cell and track it all the way through development, from a fertilized egg to an adult uh, C. elegans worm. Uh, every single cell division has been mapped out, and this is a pedigree of all the cells from start to finish. Um, so that is a tremendous uh, amount of background information that's useful for us. All right, so um, why would one want to study, instead of a human, for example, worm? So let me, let me give you some of the, uh, the benefits to this thing. First of all, the generation time for a human, 7,300 days. For a worm, three days. In fact, you can get it down to two and a half days, from egg to an adult that lays eggs. Uh, embryonic development is a long time in humans, 6,500 hours. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it's only 12 hours in this animal. That, that movie you saw takes place over about 12 hours. What you can do to it in the lab, um, well, in C. elegans, is spectacular. All the, the tools we have are really remarkable. Forget it. Don't even think about it. I mean, we're not going to do that in humans. Ethics? Don't even think about it. <laughs> we're not going to do experiments on humans. Who cares about a worm? No one. You can do whatever you want to a worm. And very importantly, what you tell your mom you work on. So I had to tell my mom, well, I'm working on 
humans because in fact you work on humans you work on humans you work on worms you also say you work on humans and the reason for that is that the genes that C. elegans has and, and the genes that humans have are largely overlapping both organisms surprisingly have about the same number of genes remarkably about 20,000 genes and there's strong overlap between these most of the fundamental core machinery to make an animal is present in both organisms and the genes are almost interchangeable there are cases where we've taken the human gene and put it into a, a worm and it, it achieves the same thing, for example. Okay, so the way that this self-assembly process occurs, these are self-assembly instructions for a little bit, a small amount of the embryonic development. This looks like a circuit diagram. Uh, it is like a circuit diagram. These little uh, three-letter words here are are genes, and these genes act on other genes, and the whole thing unfolds through a series of gene regulation processes. Uh, and we focused in particular on the development of uh, this organ, the intestine, and I'll tell you more about that in a minute. So this is one way we can look at the self-assembly instructions in this animal. And what we want to do with those instructions, in part, is to be able to use them in a way that can create, for example, new organs. Uh, and ultimately, if we learn the rules, we can do that uh, uh, for humans and create uh, new organs organs and new tissues for humans. So if you think about uh, what happens to us or what happens to a vehicle, like a car, of course, as that thing ages, it does, of course, fall apart. And uh, we can, of course, repair cars as they go along. You can get you know, replacement parts for cars and replace them. The difference between a car and a human is the replacement parts for a car have to be made separately at some factory somewhere else in the world with new atoms, uh, new cells, uh, new, not cells, new materials that have come uh, from various places around the world. In the case of uh, humans or other living organisms, because we have the capacity to regenerate, our cells are regenerated, they're born, die, and then more are born within the organism itself. Um, we have the capacity to take uh, advantage of that uh, renewal and uh, develop replacement organs, for example. I mean, that's certainly where we're headed. And there will be a time in the not too far future where we'll be able to make replacement parts for humans if we uncover the, the self-assembling rules for those organs. And so I want to touch on how we've done that a bit with C. elegans. Um, uh, one of the things that it ha has been provided to us, uh, not in C. elegans, but in general in human medicine, is uh, stem cells, pluripotent stem cells, that is cells that uh, are unspecialized but are able to produce specialized cell types of many types. In fact, you can get stem cells to turn into an entire animal um, and therefore th th the self-assembly in uh, instructions are completely encapsulated within the stem cells. Um, so that's one way to create organs. And what we've looked at is ways to uh, convert one kind of organ to another organ. So the first thing I'll tell you is we've identified a number of genetic switches, molecular switches, that can do uh, a quite remarkable thing. So for example, if we look at a normal embryo and we look at the intestine, there's the intestine in this embryo, uh, and you can't see the rest of the cells. If we turn on this particular genetic switch, switch all over the entire embryo, then what happens is the entire embryo will turn into nothing but intestine and we turn off all other pathways of development so we get no muscle no skin or anything else we just get uh, intestine all over the animal you can do the same with a different uh, molecular switch and turn the whole embryo into nothing but muscle and you can turn the whole embryo into nothing but skin with a different uh, molecular switch these switches are called transcription factors they change gene expression that tells us, first of all, that the early embryo, all the cells in the early embryo, have the capacity to turn into any organ type. They don't normally do that, but you can, you can uh, reprogram them. You can tell them to do something different. Uh, that ability to reprogram cells in the embryo is restricted in time, however. So early embryos can do what I showed you there. Later embryos have passed through a transition point, and after that transition, these cells in these embryos are committed. You can't change those cells' mind, even if you supply any of those uh, genetic switches. Um, and so we've done a lot of work in understanding that transition from a more plastic state to a more committed state. But in the process of doing that, we discovered that one, one genetic switch has the remarkable capacity to override this whole system. That is, it can act in more mature embryos, in fact, even in adults, all the way to adulthood, and completely rewire uh, the identity of cells that are normally fully functioning doing something else. So I'll give you an example of that. This is an example of what we call transorganogenesis. So the conversion of one organ into another organ, the generation of a new organ from a previous organ. 
So for example, uh, this is looking at a close up, this is a worm, this is looking at the intestine here, and in this worm, using this one genetic switch that we've identified, we can turn what was the uterus, which is normally where the eggs will be deposited and begin to develop before they're laid, into a second intestine. So we've completely switched the uterus over to an intestine. We get essentially two intestines, the normal one and a little one here. And just to try to convince you that this thing really looks like a normal intestine, this is a cross section through the worm. This is slicing right there through the worm. Here's the normal intestine. Here is the, the uterus in a normal worm where the eggs will pass. And when we undergo this process of transorganogenesis with the switch, when the worm does, then what you see is a new organ replaces the uterus and that organ looks exactly exactly like the intestine at a very high resolution level, level in the electron microscope. Uh, in every way we can look at it molecularly, that is a uh, uh, uterus that is turned into an intestine. We also can convert the heart-like organ. There is a heart-like organ in this animal that doesn't pump blood, it actually pumps food, but we can convert that over to an intestine as well. So we essentially we can achieve the conversion of a heart-like organ into intestine with a single genetic switch. And the remarkable thing is we can do this by just giving this genetics, turning this genetic switch on for 15 minutes and just waiting a couple days. That's all we have to do and then this thing's gonna happen. Uh, when it happens, also the remarkable thing is that the cells that were originally functioning, for example, as the heart or as the uterus, are, uh, they erase their original state and activate this new state. So this is just a cartoon sort of uh, uh, artist's view of what's happening here. There's not only an assembly process, a self-assembly process where the new cell types are being made, which have different characteristics, but there's a self-disassembly process. The original cell state has to be disassembled, has to be taken apart, all those parts thrown away and the new parts added. And a cell that was once a heart cell is functioning completely differently as an intestine cell. We're working on the genetic um, control of this process where you can use uh, powerful genetic tools in C. elegans to figure out what the genes are that allow this kind of process to occur. Okay, so uh, that's, I just wanted to give you a little taste of our studies in understanding developmental plasticity and how we're working to try to create new organs using this animal. Again, because the genes in C. elegans are common to those in, in humans, we think we'll learn a lot about being able to uh, 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 develop ways uh, to improve regenerative medicine in humans using these discoveries. The other problem that uh, we've been fascinated by uh, is summarized here. So the self-assembling instructions for a human are not only uh, remarkably complex, but they're also remarkably faithful. This is a very high fidelity self-assembling machine. And uh, so I won't go, I'll go three quickly through the numbers. If you imagine going from there to there, one cell to 100 trillion cells, there are, let's say, 100,000 critical, I'm just making these numbers up, 100,000 critical decisions. If any one of these decisions go wrong, it's not gonna work. So let's say there's 100,000 of them. That may be a conservative estimate. And if we have an error rate that's kind of uh, pretty good for a biological system, one in 10,000 times you make a mistake. Most of the time it works, one in 10,000 you make a mistake. And if that were the way this whole self-assembly process works, you would have this problem. The probability of success would be this number, Zero, essentially. You could never get a human if that's really how the system works. So we imagine that there must be, and we don't know much about this, this is a major unsolved problem in embryology and developmental biology. There must be systems to ensure the high fidelity of this process. So we've taken approach to understand that uh, fidelity of the process by looking at different um, genetic variants, different genetic isolates of this animal. Um, and so to give you a feel for this, I first want to, uh, I hope I can do this. Can you get the movie going or let's see. Uh, I wanna talk about this little guy here. So this guy self-assembled only two years ago, that guy right there. He finished self-assembly about two years ago and he does something I absolutely cannot do. So if you watch him, can you get the other one going too? Um, it, it, this guy keeps shooting baskets perfectly every time. Watch this. There he goes, over and over. he's two years old, right? Okay, so this guy is, he's been around the planet two years. I've been around 61 and a half years. I never could do that. I can't do it, I never could do that, right? So I miss the basket all the time. And so if we plot Titus's performance, his name's Titus, uh, so he shoots at the basket and he, his, uh, his variation around the basket is very tight, right? So the number of throws he has, they almost all end up in the basket. Okay. He doesn't. So, so my, 
that, this is my performance, right? Look at that. I mean, I just never make a basket, right? And so I am a very low fidelity machine, and he's a very high fidelity machine. So we can compare individuals as to how accurate they are in the process of development or not. And what we've found, I think, is a remarkable thing, and that is if we, uh, if we look at genetic variation across a species, C. elegans in this case, um, we have uh, a, a number of genetic variants that differ by as much as the genetic variation across the human species. That is, we all differ by about between one in a thousand and one in ten thousand individual letters in our genetic code, nucleotides or base pairs as they're called. Uh, these worms also vary by about one in a thousand to one in ten thousand words. Uh, and what these worms are, are different isolates that have been obtained from the red dots here you can see all over the world. Uh, each one of these is genetically pure. They're genetic Genetically identical, they're essentially clones, uh, but each dot differs from another clone by about that degree of variation. So we can look at these guys and say, how much are they like Titus and how much are they like Joel for any one process? And uh, when we look at that, one of the things we found that was very striking is um, that they have a similar problem that some humans have. That is, some, some of these guys do. So we are overall left, right, asymmet uh, symmetric on the outside, but internally our organs are very asymmetric, of course. We have our heart on the left, our liver on the right, and so forth. Um, and what we found is that while some of these individual isolates from around the world, these are the individual isolates all across the bottom here. These are all different strains isolated from different parts of the world. Uh, and we look at how often they make mistakes in the left-right handedness of their major organs. What we find is that some of these guys do it perfectly every time. So for including this strain over here that I'm gonna call Titus, right? Because he just makes it right every time. And then there's me, right? So some of these strains we're gonna call a strain Joel. That guy reverses its handedness frequently. That is, the organs are on the wrong side a, a substantial part of the time. That's, uh, that's, it gets up to 30% under certain circumstances. You can see about 6% of the time anyway, errors are made. That's a high error rate. Um, but the remarkable thing is that other errors creep up in these strains. So this is a very important process in biology. This is the first line of defense against cancer, for example. The process of programmed cell death. Our cells, we're killing off huge numbers of cells every day. Um, billions of cells every day. Cells that, for example, are starting to be, could become cancer cells, they're killed off. Very important process. It's also important in development. Our brains are wired the way they are because cells committed suicide at the right time and place so that the ones that were left behind are the ones that are good and do good, th good things for our brains. So uh, regulating that program cell death is very important. C. elegans was thought to have a very, very reproducible high fidelity uh, program cell death path uh, process. Um, but in fact, we find again when we look at these isolates around the world, some of them never make mistakes with programmed cell death. Virtually never, they do exactly the right thing. Some of those, so that would be including the Titus strain, the Joel strain, look at this, this is a completely different process from this one, has high rates of errors. Look, 30% of the time, cell death is occurring when it shouldn't happen based on what we know about the normal developmental process. So this guy's these guys are making mistakes in controlling cell death uh, frequently. And that's very important also because one of the very uh, important things that happens when you don't control cell death properly is neurodegenerative diseases like ALS. That's when uh, cell death occurs when it shouldn't. But notice the, the, the two strains are kind of behaving the same way, high fidelity for Titus, low fidelity for Joel, in two totally unrelated processes. These are unrelated. And when we look further, we find it gets even more curious because if we look at the variation in the number of stem cells, so C. elegans has stem cells in the germline. The germline is the tissue that gives rise to the sperm and the eggs for the next generation. So if we look at the variation in the number of stem cells, uh, what we find is that the variation in the number, not the absolute number, but the variation in the number itself varies between these different isolates. Here is uh, the Titus strain. Th it shows very low variation in the number of stem cells. That is, this Titus strain makes almost exactly the same number of stem cells every single time. Every animal has the same number of stem cells. And this guy over here that ha makes lots of errors also shows much more variation in the number of stem cells from animal to animal. So that's weird. That's completely unrelated to those other two things. And then we took like the dumbest sort of phenotype we could look at, the dumbest characteristic we could look at is just the variation in the length of the animal, right after 
the eggshell. How much variation is there in its length? Not the absolute length, but how much variation there is. And again, there we are. Titus varies much less than Joel does. Again, a completely unrelated process. So what this means is these four, in fact, more than that, quite distinct processes all show similar rates of fidelity. If it's a low fidelity strain like Joel, then all those processes are low fidelity, high error rates. If it's a high fidelity process like Titus, he's making the basket every time, all those processes are a high fidelity. So that uh, may imply that there are common systems for correcting errors in these self-assembling uh, instructions and that the genetic differences, these are genetically different strains, the genetic differences between Titus and Joel determine how high fidelity it is. The fidelity of the self-assembling instructions of embryos is controlled by genetics. Now, what we'd like to do is understand, uh, oh, this just summarizes uh, uh, actually all those uh, different characteristics together. And you can see, we just, Joel's on the high end for all these different processes, and, and on the, uh, Titus is on the low end. That is high fidelity in terms of error rates. What we'd like to do is understand uh, the, the mechanism, the molecular mechanisms that are behind this self, uh, corre this correction in the self-assembly instructions. And so what we decided to do was ask, what if we artificially try to create errors in embryos? So normally at the two cell stage with C. elegans, uh, this cell divides before that cell. So you can get this three cell stage embryo, that's actually a stage. Those two have divided, the other one hasn't. That's a normal process in the development. What happens if we try to make an error in that process? And the way we decided to try to make that error was to subject these cells to a different temperature than the other cell. Cells divide at a particular rate based on the temperature they find themselves in. A warmer cell divides faster, colder cell divides slower. So if there was no mechanism in embryos for correcting those artificially induced errors, then when this cell is on the cool side and that's on the warm side, you're going to reverse the pattern of cell division. This cell is going to divide before that cell. It's going to be an out of sequence cell division. If, however, there is a mechanism in the embryo that would, by necessity, involve communication between these cells, some way that one cell says, hey, something's going wrong, when, let's just wait a minute, I gotta make sure we're doing things right, let's correct this problem. If such a system existed, and there was no evidence uh, in, before we did the experiment that there would be such a system, then in fact, even though we've warmed up this cell and cooled down that one, we'd still get a norther, norther, uh, normal pattern of division. So what we did to do this experiment was to divide, develop uh, with mechanical engineering, Carl Meinhardt in mechanical engineering here, a microfluidics device um, that allows us to load in embryos into a microfluidic slide. We can flow them into these channels. They get trapped in these little pillars here. And then we can subject those through uh, proper temperature control to a, a very steep temperature gradient, warm on one side, cool on the other side. Um, that gradient is very steep, seven degrees across 50 microns. That's about as much as it would be if you yourself were standing in on the surface of the sun and your head was in the empty cold of space. That's a huge gradient across these embryos. They should not survive this. The remarkable thing, if, if they can't correct for that error, the remarkable thing is many of them do survive that huge temperature gradient. And when they do that, this is a very complex slide, don't worry about the details. All I'm gonna show you is that these sets of data here and here here, those represent embryos that have been put in the gradient, the temperature gradient, and have really compensated for that. They slow way down and try to fix the problem. These are embryos in which they slow down less well. They haven't slowed down to fix the problem. And these over here are just the normal embryos centered around zero. They don't do any changes at all. That's what they're all adjusted to. And the remarkable thing is the ones that really slow down and really seem to correct this problem are all the ones that live, and the ones that don't do it as well all die. They screw up. So that means the system for uh, correcting for errors is there to save these embryos. And so what we have is uh, it's th we do not see these out of sequence divisions. That tells us that there is a system in embryos that corrects for errors. These cells are talking to each other, and when they talk to each other, they correct the imposed error we're putting onto them. And so that means in the process of this remarkable self-assembly process, we believe there are, that is the first such example, but throughout the entire process, there at each step, there are quality control measures. Measures to ensure that the process has been done faithfully, and throughout the whole process, 
Quality control at each step ensures that you go from a fertilized egg to uh, a baby about half the time in the human population, about half of the fertilizations result in a uh, uh, normal human. Um, so this is a, a really remarkable process in development that has not been uh, well understood at this point. Okay, so I want to thank my group, and I'm going to come back in a second. I think I have time to say one more thing. Thank my group for all the work they've done. It's a fantastic place to be, UCSB. Uh, really exciting doing science here. Um, and one of the exciting things is that we also get to uh, do collaborations with other people, as I've implied, uh, for example, with the last project. And so I've had the great fortune to collaborate with a professor here in physics, Philip Lubin. Phil, uh, and this is uh, was came out in Scientific American earlier this year, talking about Phil's uh, project. Phil has created uh, the Interdisciplinary Center for Interstellar Exploration at UCSB. So we have kind of jumped out of the embryo here a bit. <laughs> and the remarkable uh, idea here is that we are not going to be able to get to the next star uh, at any reasonable rate, because chemical rock rocketry is going to would take to the next star take about 50 to 100,000 years. But Phil has uh, uh, come up with a roadmap using laser-driven propulsion of light sails, uh, where the plan is to send a one gram microchip. I'll show you a picture in a second. Uh, accelerate it to 20% of the speed of light head it toward the next star, and it will be able to get there in a matter of about 20 years. So in your lifetime, unfortunately, probably not my lifetime, but in your lifetimes, you may actually see a probe reaching the next star, which is a very long distance, four light years away. Um, so what does our part have to do with this thing? Well, if we want to ever travel outside the solar system across the galaxy, we have to know if life can be sustained when you do that. And so the question is, what happens as life is going from our star to the next star along the way? And the way we have decided to do that is to adapt C. elegans and these other wonderful little creatures known as water bear bears, microscopic bears. Both of these are beautifully suited for long distance travel. They can be put in suspended animation. They're very, very very small, they can fit on a one gram chip, and then we can put them in suspended animation, reanimate them, and ask them how they enjoyed the trip along the way. So that's one of the really enjoyable things that I've had being part of this university. Thanks a lot for your attention. I'd be happy to take questions. <laughs>